yes, seizures are problematic, but one of the key issues is the associated cognitive and behaviour problems that we see in some of these, if not a lot of these children, and moving into adulthood. And therefore, how much do we really know about that? And of course, there's not just the behaviour and cognition, but also the endocrinological side, and how much do we need to be concerned about that? So where do we start? Um, there is the problem. Children with epilepsy per se, but specifically associated with hypothalamic hematoma, ha do have a high rate of cognitive and behaviour problem a difficulty. And that's something I will highlight and go over the evidence base over the next few slides. However, I'm going to put it out there that the questions do remain unanswered, not least are all children at risk of developing this and how do we determine um, who may be at risk of this. Are there any features that highlight those at risk? Can we predetermine it? And then thereafter, what interventions could help other than, of course, treating the hypothalamic hematoma, and I'm not taking away from that, but um, what if there are residual difficulties? How can we intervene? And then ultimately, there's the issue with regard to endocrinological dysfunction. The association of cognitive and behaviour difficulty were first um, not recognised necessarily, but highlighted um, in the original paper in 1988 with describing this as a syndrome. Namely, that this was a descri description of four um, individuals who presented in childhood um, with epilepsy and an apparent progressive course had been noted in the evolution. Not least presenting with gelastic seizures, evolving into other seizure types with the steadily, steady um, cognitive problem, increase in cognitive problems and also in three, um, a marked behaviour problem, not least aggression and rage, which is something that consistently um, is reported as maybe a particular problem or a particular hallmark of this um, association. But what has also subsequently been described is the variability in the clinical course. Um, and therefore, it is not easy to predict exactly. Maybe early age, age of onset may be one thing that we look at, but actually, if you look at a whole case series, there may be a variability in their clinical course, their associated um, behaviour issues on an individual level. So if you look at group data, yes, there's a, a high association, but then if you look at individuals, it can be highly variable. Um, and not least this, an adult who had had laughter, episodes of laughter since the age of four years, so relatively late perhaps in pre presentation, but acknowledging that they can be difficult to recognise as problems. First tonic-clonic seizure at 13, escalation in frequency, but he stabilised and thereafter had gelastic seizures about five per month and indeed was cognitively normal and had a no other behaviour issues. So there are individuals like this and how do you tease that out when we're trying to decide on intervention? And this, actually, a, a description of what was described as the benign spectrum of hypothalamic hematomas. Um, 15 consecutive children, but actually presenting with central precocious puberty, acknowledging that actually that may be a more benign course than um, actually those that present with epileptic seizures um, as their presentation. And ultimately, this was an adult series. Um, but I think this highlights the issue about perhaps this very... Um, poor uh, evaluate, dare I say poor, um, incomplete evaluation of the individuals. Because these are 14 adults who presented um, and in fact were evaluated at six, between 16 and 56 years. Um, 11 had had epilepsy from childhood but had only had the hypothalamic hematoma diagnosed in adult life and three presented with seizures in adult life. None of them had supposedly had a diagnosed psychiatric disorder, but there was no evidence that this had actually really been evaluated within the paper. And indeed, there was a description of poor peer relationships and the individuals tended to be loners. So I suspect there was more to that than was actually manifest. And actually, if it had been evaluated in detail, there'd be more um, that would have come to the fore. And there's the other issue, of course, about how much of a problem there may be dependent on the presentation. And this, we, um, we looked at, um, at that stage, 34 of the children that are presented to Great Ormond Street Hospital over the past 15 years. And indeed, um, 30, of the 34, 14 um, had presented with epilepsy, 14 with central precocious puberty, and um, indeed six 
had had this as an incidental finding on, on doing an MRI scan for another reason, not epilepsy and not developmental problems. Um, and indeed, of those who presented with epilepsy, um, precocious, precocious puberty was seen also in four. And of those who actually presented with precocious puberty, four had also had epilepsy. But interestingly, these were only diagnosed once they'd presented and more of a description um, of what the attacks were had came to the fore and were recognised. And there was some issue, as others have found, about whether it's a sessile or a pedunculated um, uh, hypothalamic hamartoma. Those were more likely to be sessile in the epilepsy group as opposed to pedunculated in the um, precocious puberty group. And, of course, the whole issue about multiple seizure development there were 13 out of the 14 with epilepsy. But, of course, we are a complex epilepsy unit. <clears throat> so they're more likely to come to us um, because there's difficulty in controlling their seizures. When we're evaluating the degree of cognitive beha and behaviour problems and specifically what types of behaviour difficulty you might see, there's actually um, considerable problems in looking at the literature. Not least because there's a lot, as, as Jack referred to earlier, um, many of the papers are presenting anecdotal data, case series, not really looking at broad... Um, and it's not, it is a rare disease, and therefore trying to collect cohorts can be quite difficult. Diagnosis is often delayed. Large series are surgically based, not surprisingly, and therefore they've been referred with drug resistance and because they have complex epilepsy and problems. Um, and therefore also the issue about how much the epilepsy is the presenting feature in overall is quite difficult to determine. So what um, colleagues of mine have done recently um, is try to evaluate the behaviour um, uh, presentations in a little more detail. And first of all, and this is um, Georgina Corbett Butcher. Thank you. I couldn't remember her surname. She's a fellow who works with Isabel Heyman, a consultant neuropsychiatrist at our hospital, who's been working within the epilepsy surgery program for some time. So they first did a systematic review um, and with the inclusion criteria um, of um, hypothalamic hamartoma had been diagnosed on MRI. There was detail of neuropsychology review as well as clinical review and symptoms were between 19. So this was looking at children, not adults. Um, published after 1970 in English. Case series more, with more than three cases, so that's still quite small, um, and no known associated genetic syndrome. And so of the papers identified, 268 papers since 1970. On looking at literature reviews, that's actually not very many. Um, and papers after duplicates removed 170, 76 excluded because they really didn't give us the data that was required to, to evaluate. So 94 were assessed for full text eligibility. So this was screening them with abstracts. You could eliminate a whole no, um, pile because 76 because they didn't really give any data. And then 94 were assessed for um, full text for eligibility. And again, because the data or they didn't fulfill the criteria, 47 excluded, which gives us 29 papers that actually give us some data. That's not very many. And this is a summary of the data as they showed. 29 papers, 49% um, reported pre- and post-intervention, so possibly surgery, a variety of different types. 52% were just descriptive, so describing um, a cohort of patients and the range of problems. Um, the median number in the actual papers was eight patients, between three and 38, 61% male. The mean age of assess median age of assessment was nine years. 88% of those individuals in these papers had epilepsy with a mean age of on median age of onset of 12 months. And you can see most of the studies came from North America or Europe, um, four from Asia, one from Australasia, and one from South America. And this just summarises the data as they determined. Looking at paediatric cases only, there were 26 de dealing with behavioural and emotional problems and 23 papers um, reporting on cognition. Um, the total number of children, 260 in behavioural and 239 in cognition. Now, this is the behavioural diagnoses. So you can see there's a wide range of diagnoses. Somebody asked about ADHD um, earlier. There we go. 
coming up to 16% um, reporting with ADHD, aggression rage at 25%, and a variety of others, including OCD, um, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, depressive mood, but many of them just describe non-specific behaviour disorder without any specific um, DSM-4 diagnoses, and this was in 45% of the individual children. With regard to cognitive problems, you can see actually that 53% were reported as having intellectual disability. So actually, you can see here in this pie chart, around a third were reported as having no cognitive problem, which I thought was relatively high, actually. <laughs> um, and then this was severe here. But acknowledging these papers were since 1970, there's a high degree of variability as to the actual cognitive ass assessment made and whether it was qualitative or indeed quantitative. And by that, quantitative is when you're doing full neuropsych evaluation, getting specific scores, as opposed to descriptive, going mild, moderate, or severe, which in some papers is what, what is described. So the limitations of this um, review um, was there was actually quite a lot of overlapping data. So even though we had these 239 and uh, 250 patients, many of them were the same patient reported in different papers. So there's a lot of overlapping data. I'm not supposed to do that anymore, but this is what's been done historically. There's also a lack of standardization, of course, with regard to the assessments and indeed reporting. So it's absolutely impossible to do any form of multi um, uh, meta-analysis to, to give overall results. There are a certain number of highly selected small samples, a, con a, a consistent lack of longitudinal data, um, and a subset, because they were so severe, ha were unable to complete cognitive tests, which, which um, led to the lack of quantitative data. So what they've also done, um, Georgina and Isabel, is look at... Um, 46 patients, sort of increase in numbers as we go on because we're discovering them um, out of the woodwork in, in the sense of not that we didn't know about them, they're just getting the data from the database. Um, so we've got 46 children that we looked at a very specifically our, our cohort to look at the notes, look at who'd had assessment and try and get a DSM-4 diagnosis. We're yet to, um, certainly there, are, there is cognitive data and 50% of them have intellectual disability. But 70%, or almost 72%, were listed as having at least one, if not more, psychiatric diagnoses as per the standardised procedure of diagnosis, the DSM-4 criteria. And this, 72%, you could argue, is very similar to our other children coming, for example, for assessment for temporal lobe surgery. 72% of them have a DSM-4 diagnosis either before or after surgery, 83% at any point in time. And in our frontal lobe group, though those coming for frontal lobe surgery, it's 52%. So you could argue, is this any more um, than, than standard? But that aside, I would argue that 46% exhibiting rage or aggression is a disproportion to our other groups of patients coming to surgery. And you can see here the range of, of um, disorders, 26% ADHD, bearing in mind that you know, a lot of children have more than one diagnosis. So that, these aren't relating to individual children, it's number of diagnoses. So ADHD in 26%, mood disorders in 22%, and there was even uh, OCD in 11%, eating disorders in 4%, autistic spectrum disorder 15%. So in the um, conclusions from that, um, it seems the children presenting to us at Great Thomas Street Hospital, which you would argue, yes, it may be a more biased group, but not necessarily. Once the hypothalamic hamartoma has been diagnosed with epilepsy, then they tend to get referred to a tertiary unit. Psychiatric symptoms are determined in most children. But there's a highly variable clinical picture there appear, it's probable that there's multifactorial etiology, although you could argue, do we really know enough to say that? But we need to look at other things. We need to look at correlation analysis and longitudinal study. Can we predict psychiatric outcomes from correlating with clinical imaging, EEG variables, or even whether there's been an intervention? And that's something that's not there in the literature at the present time.
Um, and certainly the current literature poses enormous problems for even collecting data together and doing a meta-analysis. So there it probably is a very much a clinical need, um, and we know that for an integrated psychological and psychiatric assessment in all children with hypothalamic hematoma, and a, a need to think about what possible interventions there could be, not necessarily just treating the hematoma, but what other behavioural interventions might help. Um, thinking about different children at different points of their natural history. And certainly, um, our, the neuropsychiatrists firmly believe that for many different um, types of behaviour disorder associated with epilepsy per se, some of our standard um, behavioural interventions can help. But what we don't know is whether they will help in very specific disorders. But certainly, something that we're undertaking at Great Ormond Street is trials of current evidence-based treatments, and included in that would be a multitude of different etiologies. But whether we will get a big enough cohort to know whether focused interventions will help is something we need to look at. And certainly we have to listen to our parents and our individuals in the fact that, you know, what they report is something that may need to be tackled on an individual level. And certainly the aggression and rage is something that I think is, is something that is reported on a regular basis. We need to think about what the pathophysiology is, how we can um, look at intervening. But these are all very individual comments about living with a child with hypothalamic hematoma, um, physical aggression towards both parents. She's a great deal of difficulty relating to her peers. Um, his aggressive outbursts can occur with a minimal, even no trigger, and can result in others being hurt. Um, and this is something that obviously greatly affects quality of life for the families. When looking as to how we may intervene, then we need to look at perhaps the, um, this is a very general, um, and I say general, it's something that Isabel Heyman has thought about and, and put together in the fact that many of our children come to us with um, an underlying etiology as a cause for their epilepsy, and how much is that also responsible for the psychopathology? But there are other things that may actual, actually impact, not least the effect on it on physical side and educational consequences, but also um, how they respond to that, how they react to that, that's going to affect on their day-to-day -day behavior. And they're also going to have other impacts, which are also going to impact then again on the psychopathology. And it's, oh, help if I press the right button. So, you know, we're going to have the response that's going to give the parent self-image, the adverse family consequences, how the interaction is between the family, the adverse social consequences, and that, however much there's one consistent cause and the trigger, how the responses may then have an impact on the overall psychopathology um, in the longer term. And, of course, then, is, can we have an impact on the treatment with a more um, global-based treatment, as opposed to in conjunction with the treatment of the underlying etiology. And this was Isabel trying to think of it in a little bit of a more specific um, case with regard to um, hypothalamic hematoma, but the issue is the arrows are going all over the place as to what's going to have an impact, and it gets very, very complex, and therefore each individual way forward is going to depend on the presentation and indeed family circumstances of each child. So just um, for um, as a, an end point really is, that, you know, having dealt with the behaviour side and cognition and highlighting the fact that we still have a lot more to know and therefore requires much more in the way of study, both from a delineation of the problems as well as what interventions may help. The, the other issue is of course the endocrinological issue um, and there is a risk, of course, which with any abnormality of um, the hypothalamic region of a whole range of um, endocrinological dysfunction. Pre precocious puberty, of course, is the one aspect that HH can present with, with or without epilepsy. But there are other issues that um, endocrinologists really fun focus down on, not least growth, um, thyroid function, the weight gain that we discussed earlier, um, ACTH or cortisol deficiency, and diabetes insipidus. But what's interesting is that although central precocious puberty may actually be a presenting feature 
much of these are only really seen or become concerned about in a post-operative or a post-intervention um, circumstance. They're not usually seen as a pre-operative um, uh, concern. And that's highlighted by this study. Um, this was a study that came from Melbourne, um, looking at 29 children who were evaluated for surgery for, uh, surgery for their hypothalamic hematoma for management of the epilepsy. So they had come for management of the epilepsy, not for endocrine assessment per se. And what was quite clear is that this, this was um, a gonadotrophin um, stimulating test and looking at cortisone, um, and that, that actually there were only four of the 29 who showed inappropriate responses in the stimulation test preoperatively. All the others were appropriate. And in here, this is the free T4. Um, this is the gonadotrophin hormone. So here, there was only a very small number that would actually be thought to be below, um, uh, in the low range preoperatively. So actually, some of them show biochemical changes, but showing overt changes in their endocrine function is quite rare when presenting um, with epilepsy as their primary um, presenting feature. Then, of course, the issue is the danger and the risk from the intervention to the hypothalamic hamartoma, and that's what then needs to be looked at, although in their series, which was predominantly transclosal approach to surgical resection, um, there was very little in the way of dysfunction. There may be transient diabetes insipidus, um, but the weight gain, Jack um, alluded to earlier, with a, uh, and somnolence may be a problem in the short term. But actually, um, it's not, a, a, although we need to carefully evaluate it, depending on the intervention, prior to intervention, um, it's not a very specific problem. So there's no doubt that in the group of children with, uh, and adults with hypothalamic hamartoma, endocrine dysregulation needs to be assessed. They may be noted to have a subclinical um, dysfunction, but it's mainly pre-surgical pre and it's mainly post-surgically that there needs to be ongoing um, assessment and evaluation in case intervention is required. Of course, then, if we return to the behaviour and cognition, of course, looking beyond the seizures, education is important. Acknowledgement of the possible issues, both in family and with regard to schooling, with regular neuropsychological assessment and a requirement for the appropriate placement and support. But with regard to behaviour, we need to delineate a lot more what the phenotype may be. In an individual, we need careful assessment and awareness of the problems, how much it may impact on the education, give psychiatric support and, and the appropriate behavioural management. But that needs to go alongside, as I've said, delineating what the phenotypes might be to see if they're very specific issues, what they may correlate with with regard to clinical evaluation and whether very specific interventions may be required. So children may vary in presentation and evolution with regard to the um, syndrome of hypothalamic hamartoma, and there's no doubt they care require careful regular assessment. We do need further delineation of the cognitive and behaviour profiles. Are they specific to hypothalamic hamartoma? Are there specific profiles and more general profiles? What is the relationship to the epilepsy? We think there's a high association, but we need to think about at what stage in the natural history. And what is the response of those behaviours to standard interventions that we have available that are evidence-based? And ultimately, although it's not related necessarily to the um, behaviour profile, we don't think so anyway, we do need to make sure we consider the endocrine function, um, getting baseline assessments, but have paying specific um, uh, um, attention to those who have surgical or otherwise intervention of the hematoma. But we do need to think about, again, standard protocols um, for assessment and indeed documentation post-intervention. Thank you. wondering which is your experience with the uh, behavior and cognitive uh, before and after surgery I mean do you think they improve or 
the note, or do, do you have data about that? We did attempt to look at that from our population, but the, pop the trouble is with our, the, the original cohort of 34, that um, about 50% of them had had an intervention and they were all quite varied interventions, whether it be surgical approach, which surgical approach, gamma knife surgery. Um, so it, it, we couldn't see a definite correlation. Certainly um, in a small number and, and anecdotal cases, there was an improvement with seizure control but with others, there were some behaviours that persisted. So um, I think there is an issue, still an issue, about timing of your intervention. When you get, you know, we get these children maybe quite far down the road, you know, so that impacts on your timing of intervention um, and ultimately how you predict who's going to need that intervention. Helen, with uh, regards to the, the behavior, the rage, uh, episodic rage, um, I have a patient who almost gives the feeling that these are all around the time of seizures, um, as opposed to uh, other triggered events. Um, is that something that we see, is that the flavor of the episodic rage, or is it an independent uh, psychiatric problem? I would suggest it's not necessarily related to seizures. It appears to be independent, and I look at the families because I think it's their experience as well. They can. It's, it's interesting because if you see, you know, you can see um, behavior change around, you know, in other chil the children with other types of epilepsy um, or other etiologies. And it can be a variable pattern. You know, some describe them that they, you can tell they're building up to a seizure because they have change in behavior. Once they've had the seizure, it resolves. Others, if they have more seizures, the behavior is worse. So, again, these are patterns we see anyway. Um, but I think the intermittent rate, it's, it's, Although some may report, as you do, that it's related to the seizures, there are some that it's not related to the seizures at all, you know, and therefore it's about your experience. So it, it appears independent. It, it, this is a sort of general pattern rather than actually related to only the seizures. Yeah. Ruth. And to one more question, Helen, is there, um, when we're choosing drugs um, uh, like carbamazepine, for example, yeah. um, do they seem to have a, 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 a positive, or is there experience with certain drugs having a positive impact, partic particularly on episodic rage, uh, than, you know, than just more than uh, other uh, cognitive? I don't think we've got enough data, and the problem is, is that you know, you try the medication for the seizures and more often than not it doesn't do anything to the seizures, so you're varying it around. You know, in other conditions, again, in other etiologies, sometimes you see that carbamazepine has a behavior modifying effect, but it's not something I've seen, but it's only a small cohort. And I'll look at Nicola and the others, no, Jack, no, no. whether you've... No, no, I, I don't think so. Dan? Uh, th thanks for the talk. Uh, clear as usual, uh, but I want you to, I was wondering if I could get you to speculate on the neuroanatomic sources of rage. Mm. Uh, is there something special about the anatomy of HH kids that we may know from previous studies that would make them inclined to rage? Where do you think it's coming from? And do you have a, do you in your clinic have a strategy like a, like a uh, simple protocol for approaching these? Um, I'll tackle the second question first. Because <laughs> typical neurosurgeon asking me an anatomical question. Um, that's my, <laughs> um, no, the, the second, as far as specific strategy, I, I think we have, um, you know, Isabel's, uh, apart from the utilizing Isabel to a huge degree, who's our neuropsychiatrist, her strategy is trying to gain specific goals and, you know, maybe how they, um, families will manage the rage. I mean, it's not easy, but, you know, they're not completely oblivious that it's the, the kids happening and trying to get time out and calming. I'm not, you know, that then, but it may also be more individual to the individual family as to how they deal with that. 
Um, as far as neuroatomical, I mean, I think the issue is the whole is issue of emotion, possible links with the limbic system, but I'm speculating, you know. I think, you know, we think of the hypothalamus and its regulation um, component, um, and if you've got, it, th there may be different aspects as to why the range, whether, you know, it's the way their mood swings or their, their, the way they feel, their reaction to, to certain uh, uh, situations, and of course the whole issue about gelastic and dacristic seizures. But I think, you know, that the whole um, connections and possible connections within the limbic system and dysregulation of that, I think, it may well have an impact on it. Jack, do you want to comment? I just had one comment, uh, which is, um, in, in my comment is that the hallmark psychiatric symptom for the HH patients, which is the, let's call it a rage behavior, doesn't correspond well to the DSM, you know, diagnostic category. No, you're true. So yeah, th yeah. there's like four or five different diagnoses that get applied to these patients who were all having basically that, that same problem. Yeah. So it, it, it's a weakness of the DSM yes. system specific to this condition. And absolutely, and I, and I think when I looked at the, the slide that we showed the list of DSM-4 diagnoses, you would see that rage aggression wasn't actually listed on that. We, we had it separate because it was difficult to, to allocate into one diagnosis. Absolutely right. Just last question, maybe. <laughs> ADHD um, medications, is there a place for them? Is there any record if the patient's response? I think, again, you know, it's a case of, well, in our experience, we, you know, if it's an isolated symptom and it's out of proportion to the age, cognitive age of the child, we may trial it um, and with variable success. I know, again, looking at standard interventions for this, you know, we, these are all not treating the cause, <laughs> they're treating the symptom and therefore taking the standard approach. There's no problem with that, uh, assessing that there's careful evaluation to see whether there really has been a response. But also we have to bear in mind the cognitive age of the children because the attention may not be out of proportion to that, that in the dis for those diagnoses we made that was, but sometimes that's, that's the case. Marius. Can I ask if, if there is any antipsychotic medication that is used usually for the rage or they, it is treated mainly behaviorally? In certain circumstances, we've used Risperidone. Yes. The view as well? Risperidone. About you, Jack? Yeah. We use, nods around we the... Use always Risperidone. Yeah. With good results. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, variable quite results. Quite <laughs> yeah. Variable, not yeah. quite good. Yeah. Overall good. Yeah, but we're talking about small numbers of cases. That's the problem. Okay, I think I've had my 30 minutes. <laughs> Go on, <take> <laughs>